Hey guys, I want to keep talking to you about uh, uh, David and what we can get from David's life and apply it to ourselves um, in modernity, I suppose. Uh, in Second Samuel, we've been talking First Second Samuel. Look at uh, chapter 12, and we we see that, uh, that David is is called out on this sin with Bathsheba, um, and uh, and Nathan comes to him and offers. It's a, it's this great uh, this this great illustration that he gives him. This great uh, way to make David understand what he'd done and how wrong it was. Um, you get down there and, and eventually he says, this is you. You are that man. You are the man that you say deserves death. And David gets it and he says, you know, I've sinned with Bathsheba and, and, uh, and I, I murdered so I could have her. And, and uh, God hands down a punishment. And one of, the, one of the things in that punishment in verse 13, it says, David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. The Lord says, uh, um, Lord has taken away your sin, you shall not die, or because of the deed, give occasion of the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Uh, that's a, a big deal. It's a big theme, especially in, in, in the Old Testament, where uh, if you cause the love of God to go cold in somebody else, it, it, is, I mean, it, it is a huge deal. Um, and uh, in fact, if you've ever heard me, heard me preach my message on what it means to be genuine, um, it, it would be... Uh, you'd probably get it even more. And uh, it also says, though, in verse 11, uh, I will rise, raise up evil against you from within your own household. Uh, David has kind of a, a family curse given to him at this point where God says, you know what, you're, you're going to have a lot of problems because of the way you've been living your life. Um, if you remember, the, this is almost kind of, a, kind of a theme in David's. I don't know if it's as much of a curse as much as it is God saying, you know what, uh, this is how it is because of the way you are. Um, if you remember, we were talking previously about Michal, David's first wife, his first love, uh, how she despised him, uh, how she said some things against him because he was worshiping God, and she and it, it irked her to no end um, because he took off his kingly robes and he basically he abased himself before God publicly, and she accused him of dancing naked before you know before all of the the servant women in order that he can. You know, that he can uh, seduce them. And he wasn't naked, if you remember I pointed that out. He was wearing an ephod. He was, but he had this robe from his robes of honor, uh, who he was as a, as a public figure. He said, I'm just any other human, uh, and I want to worship my God in spirit and truth. Um, but David has, if you look at David, he has a lot of wives. And uh, I've been thinking about this lately because I've, I've got a lot of, a lot of friends that are having some, uh, some turmoil in their lives, uh, that have had some some issues in relationships, whether it's marriage or remarriage or divorce or uh, loss of a loved one or a bad breakup, those sorts of things. And, and so relationships is a theme that runs all all through the Bible. If you look back, I mean, one of the first stories that we have with two human beings is a wedding. Um, so so David has a lot to teach us about relationships. Uh, one of the things that we have when we get into a new relationship is this desire to impress the other person. Uh, look, look at Hollywood, look at, look at TV shows. One of the things that you often see as a theme is people lying in order to get the other person to like them and it all blows up and it goes bad. It's because we want to impress somebody. We feel good when somebody learns something about us and they like that, especially when it's true. Um, but we have the desire and the, really the need to be uh, told good things about ourselves, to impress other people, to make them, uh, to, to make ourselves desirable to them. Um, you know, still, like I said, it's done in new relationships, and, and it's um, all those things that you can share, all those things you tell, the stories or those attributes about yourself. When you're married, the spouse eventually learns all those things. You might have heard people say, you know, we got divorced because we just ran out of stuff to talk about, uh, or we fell out of love. I think one of the reasons we hear that uh, is because because the other person sees through all those things that we are. They know who we really are. We can't lie to them and tell them things that you know, about ourselves that they don't know because it's it's going to be evident. It's going to be obvious to them, and we we can literally run out of stuff to talk about. That is, if we're not making new stuff to talk about on a regular basis. Um, and, and you look at it, and you might have heard of something called the seven-year itch, where, uh, you know, about between about the year six and eight or so, <clears throat> you, uh, you know, you, you start to, to, really, to, to really lust after other people because you've come to that point where you've exhausted a lot of what you know about each other, 
and uh, the, the grass is looking mighty greener on the other side. And so a lot of people will, will at about that point in, you know, in our human relationships, they, they tend to, to start wandering. Um, and that's why a lot of marriages end after, you know, three to five years because they're, you know, that's, that's kind of come up and surface. And I think that comes back to that, uh, that need to impress the other person. We're, we've come to the point where we can't easily do that anymore. And let's face it, we're, we're lazy. We, we don't want to have to do the work. Um, you know, when we talk about the seven-year itch and, you know, and, and sex, and obviously we're, we're all sexual creatures. It's how we were made. Uh, it, that doesn't mean that, you know, that if we were made a certain way, that that's how we were intended to be. Whether you know, I, I've been, I, I've been discussing homosexuality a lot with uh, with other people just recently. I'll, I'll be blogging about that uh, in the near future. I don't really, I personally, I don't believe that we're that we're uh, that we were that somebody's born gay genetically. They haven't been able to isolate and find a gene. I don't think we can say it is until it's scientifically proven. They say it has been, uh, and yet the evidence isn't there. Doesn't mean, however, that if you are born gay, that that's you know that that that's how God wants you to be. I'm, I'm, I'm born straight, and God doesn't want me to go out and, and have sex with everybody. Um, <clears throat> we, we're still called to rein ourselves in, to live to where God has set a standard for. Uh, it, it's just like, and, and um, people are I'm probably being lit up right now, people are you know, all upset about that, but uh, just because somebody is born, and now this is where, where I'm going with this, um, just because we might be made a certain way does not mean that's the way that God intends us to be. And uh, people say, well, no, I am, am made this way, so God wants me to live this way. Uh, what about somebody with birth defects or with a, with a birth deformity or something like that? That doesn't mean that's how God wants them to be. Uh, that's a product of the sin nature, the fallen nature of mankind. It's something that we all have to overcome uh, to each and every culture, to each and every individual. Um, but anyway, so I'm not actually, I don't want to actually discuss homosexuality today. We want to talk about relationships and, and what this, this thing with Samuel, or not Samuel, with David in 2 Samuel means. What does it mean to a Christian uh, when, we, when people fall out of love with us, when we have, find it difficult to impress our spouse uh, or our, even just our, our friends? Uh, and you look, if you look in, uh, in chapter 13, you see Amnon and Tamar. You see a relationship gone horribly, horribly wrong there. It should have ended in, uh, in some kind of a marriage and ended with, uh, with one of David's sons murdering another of his sons. Uh, what it shows is we have a great need for sanctification. All throughout Scripture, we have these great illustrations, these great demonstrations of how relationships uh, are evident of our faith, are evident of our, our relationship with God, uh, how they... How they should parallel and should mirror that. So if we need to be sanctified, which sanctified means to become closer, more God-like, more Christ-like, um, there's a couple of verses here, because a lot of people don't understand what sanctification is. Ephesians 4.13 says, Until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So to be like Christ. That's what it means to be sanctified. It means to be you know, holy, to be set apart from everything else, and be more and more like God. So as we have a spouse, if we have some, uh, some other relationship and we start running out of those things to talk about, to, uh, to be together with, uh, you know, we need to, to understand that uh, as it gets harder and harder to impress, and that shows how it is when, when we're being sanctified, it gets harder and harder to reach that next level, level of Christ-like maturity. Uh, what is it? It's a, it's a call to rise above. As we live with our spouse, we need to love them in such a way to go that extra effort, to go that extra mile, and to push through all those things that are hard in life so that we can impress them. Uh, and, and it gets hard because once you set a bar somewhere and it's comfortable, it's easy just to shoot in underneath that all the time. Uh, whereas, it, it, which is something that we, we do when we're married or when we have another relationship, and we tend to do that and that leads to that love growing cold. I heard a pastor friend of mine once say we were talking about carnal Christianity and how you know people will go up and down and stuff and they're walking in, in uh, they're walking life with God. And he said, I've, I, he said I discovered this. He said we're always either going up or we're going down. We never plateau with God because you can't remain there. That's lukewarm. Is it getting hotter or we're getting colder? And he said, be be hot, brother. So I'll leave you with that. Be hot.